I speak in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. I don't know whether any of you have been to Shakespeare's Globe Theatre replica, which is here for the summer. A pop-up theatre on Clifford Tower car park. I was there with a friend this week to see Macbeth. It was a good performance and was received by an enthusiastic audience. As you will know, of all Shakespeare's plays, it is amongst the most cruel and vicious with fighting, ambition, murder, and the shedding of false blood, his main predominating feature, both on the actors and on the floor of the theater. Without blood, we would not be alive. It circulates round the body at top speed, completing the circuit in a few seconds, delivering nutrients as it goes, and being sifted out of waste by the liver as it passes there. But inside the body is one thing. It is when blood escapes from the body that it horrifies people, who know that if we lose too much of it, we die. I imagine a vegetarian might feel uncomfortable if they had to go into a butcher's shop, as however clean it is there, there is still a vague smell lingering in the air. I used to eat meat every day, but now I eat far less. And I have now become aware of the smell of the meat if I do go to the butchers, and I am glad to come out into the fresh air, something I was never aware of before. In our reading this morning, Jesus has spoken in a synagogue in deep theological terms, which the disciples are endeavoring to understand. By now, he has attracted a large band of followers who are hoping that he is the Messiah that they are expecting. Before Jesus gave his talk in the synagogue, they had had high hopes, for they had seen many signs and wonders of healing and exorcism. Jesus taught with authority and seemed to have knowledge far outstripping that of the scribes and the Pharisees although he was apparently untaught in worldly terms. But Jesus in the synagogue had said, Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood remains in me and I in him. Just as the living Father sent me, and I live because of the Father, so the one who feeds on me will live because of me. Now we all know what Jesus meant by this from our church life. And we have been reminded of this in the sermons of the last three weeks from John chapter 6. However, the disciples at that time did not know or begin to understand what Jesus meant when he said, if you wish to follow me into eternal life, you must eat my flesh and drink my blood. They were not cannibals. Compared to the days of walking the countryside among throngs of people, of healings, miracles, teachings, which were clothed in parables so that they could understand, sadnesses turned to joys, illnesses to health, and free bread for the hungry, they were now having to face stark facts. Jesus could not have said anything more far away from everything Jesus' followers had been brought up to believe. Hadn't they always been taught that blood would, uh, should never be eaten as it re represented life? And wasn't the blood always ceremoniously drained from animals that were to be eaten, according to the law in Leviticus chapter 17, verse 10? There had to be no risk that there was any blood left in the animal. It was the chief aim of kosher butchering. And for a human to consume the blood of any animal was a deliberate affront to the Jewish mind, let alone consuming the blood of a human person. Gradually, many of the disciples came to see what might be ahead of them. It was clear that Jesus was antagonizing the authorities, and now the Jewish people as well. By attacking their main beliefs, 
No longer was this going to be as it had been. But it was to be a life in which they might lose family, friends, and even life itself. This can be seen as a tipping point in which the successful ministry of Jesus, the gathering of disciples, the approbation of the crowds, would begin to dwindle away. Many disciples left Jesus, returned to their homes and families, and to their previous occupations, having decided that Jesus was not the one they were to expect, and they might look in vain for another. I can imagine how sad they all felt. The problem is that if we're brought up strictly with a certain view of the world, as the Jewish people were, it's then very difficult to change. If people try to demolish the way we and all the people around us see the world, we tend to dismiss it. At the Edinburgh Book Festival recently, I heard a talk by a well-known atheist. I listened with interest, trying to understand how he reached his point of view. I knew he would mention the creation, and so he did. That one of his major points. We all know that science has proved the world was not made in seven days. Nevertheless, this is a very ancient book. When it was written, there would be no conception of the billions of years it has taken for the world to reach this point. At least the sequence of events is not too far from reality, and that is how I saw it. In other words, I heard what the speaker said, saw how he'd reached his conclusions, and in my own mind dismissed his findings because his worldview wasn't mine. Now the tone of Jesus' ministry had changed. Realism had entered the field. The sacrifice that would be needed was great. Baptisms, miracles, signs no longer took central stage. Disciples and followers fell away and hatred from the authorities grew. Jesus was not the conquering hero the people expected. He had refused the more selfish requests. Some of his teachings had been difficult to understand and to accept. And so this was Jesus' last appearance in Galilee in the synagogue in Capernaum. When some of the disciples and some followers had left Jesus, he turned to the twelve and said, You are not going away as well, are you? And Peter, as the spokesman, said, Who can we go to? You have the words of eternal life. You are God's holy one. And like the disciples and followers of Jesus at that time, we have the privilege of hindsight. People then were not to know about the future resurrection of Jesus or the fact that Jesus' message in the form of Christianity would spread over all the world. And if what I have read is correct, uh, Christianity outnumbers other faiths, though it often doesn't seem like it. Nor could the disciples and followers know of Jesus' words at the Last Supper, in which he took bread gave thanks and broke it, and gave it to them, saying, This is my body given to you. Do this in remembrance of me. And likewise, after supper, he took the cup and gave it to them, saying, This is my new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. Drink this in memory of me. In the Eucharist, as we take the bread and drink the wine, we are united with Christ, so that we can, in the power of the Holy Spirit, go out and give Christ to the world. I will close with two passages from St. Paul to the Ephesians. One of the readings was for last week, and it was, Be careful how you live. Make the most of every opportunity. Be filled with the Spirit. Speak about religious matters to each other. Make music to the Lord. And give thanks to God for everything in the name of our Lord. And in the second, in which St. Paul talks uh, about putting on the armour of God, which we've just heard this morning. As a spiritual battle is not against enemies of blood and flesh, 
but against the spiritual forces of evil in heavenly places, and to pray in spirit at all times. The armour enables us not to fight, but it enables the Christian to stand firm and resist the flaming arrows of the evil one. We can return to Peter's words of faith to Jesus when he said, Who can we go to? We have the words of eternal life. You are God's holy one. We know that to follow Jesus can be hard. But for us it makes sense of things and gives a purpose to life. The Holy Spirit gives us the power to overcome short-term difficulties and points to an eternal future. A life well lived as much as with the help of God we are able and everything else is passing. In a few moments we will have the privilege to making our act of remembrance in the Eucharist in belief and faith. Amen.